There's a technological concept that I talk about with friends a lot that we call the plateau. This is the notion of a period in history where people don't have to upgrade their computers for surprisingly long periods. I mean, I can tell you that going all the way back to the 80s, there's been this recurring joke that, hey, a computer's obsolete as soon as you open the box. It was in Weird Al Yankovic's It's All About the Pentiums, right? This has been a meme since like boomers were young. It just keeps going. But is it really true? Well, it all depends on what you do with your computer. If you keep doing the same stuff that you always did, a lot of computers will last a very long time. The trouble is that people tend to actually change what they're doing and they don't want to admit it or they don't notice it. If you're editing standard definition video, then a computer from 2003 that was good at that then will still be good at it now. But you probably don't do that, right? You probably started editing HD video or you started doing more with SD video than you ever did back then. If you really truly stick with the same tasks you always did, computers last an awful long time. I used to work PC Recycle, and I cannot tell you how many people came in in 2011 with machines they bought in 2003 that had just died, and that's the only reason they were replacing them. I've gotten comments on my videos before from people upset that I upload in 4K60 because YouTube doesn't produce a 60 FPS version that they can watch on their computer from 2010. I'm sorry, I can't help you without hurting everyone else, but it's interesting that this is apparently the first thing they've encountered that has made them think that they should maybe upgrade their 12-year-old computer. That means that whatever they were doing 12 years ago is probably still what they're doing now. And the same applies to anyone who doesn't change what they're doing. If you're just writing books, for instance, if you use your computer for a word processor, then you don't need one from the last 12 years or 20 years or 30 years. You can get an original Macintosh from 1984. It'll do everything you want. If you really are just writing books, you could use a Pentium with Word 95 and it would be massive overkill. You ever looked at Word 95? It's absurd how much it can do. You can put in full color images, you can generate tables, you can embed editable spreadsheets, you can put in form fields and auto-populated template values and the headers and footers, you can generate tables of contents automatically. It's obscene how much power Word 95 had compared to what the average individual did with it. And in the last 20 years, I've been hard pressed to figure out what Microsoft is adding in each release other than a much worse UI. So that's an example of a plateau. Computers got perfect at basic word processing by the mid 80s. You could also say they got perfect at photo editing by the late 2000s and that they got perfect at video editing by Wait, but seriously, people were editing HD video on MacBooks in 2009 with iMovie HD, and while there have been improvements, I think most folks would still be happy with that. The only downside is that it might not keep up with 4K video, and I don't know if it works with modern codecs like H.264 and H.265, but most people probably don't care about that. So if you're still doing what you were doing in 2009, then your MacBook from 2009 will probably keep up. Problem is, that's not really how most of us work, is it? Many of the people watching this video are like me. We don't do one or two things with our computers. We do 50, and we wanna do them all at once. And we always wanna do the newest thing, right? That, of course, pushes us to get better and better machines so we can start doing stuff that we weren't doing eight years ago or 15 years ago. And then on top of everything, there is, of course, the internet. Even if you really do spend most of your time writing, you probably can't escape from the internet, can you? Because you wanna be able to go use Google to do research. You wanna go pull up reference images on Google image search, and you wanna be able to go to YouTube to look up videos about the subjects you're writing about. Unless you're writing pure fiction, in which case, well, I don't know, maybe you wanna look up some cool monsters. Almost nobody can resist the siren call of Google. And that's a lot of what keeps us on the upgrade treadmill. It's keeping up with the web. If it weren't for the web and video games, lots of people would still be happy with Core 2 Duos, Pentium 4s, or even older machines. The web itself gets more bloated every year, and our operating systems are constantly getting patched and updated to support new online features or to make them more secure online. The internet is almost single-handedly responsible for the skyrocketing volume of e-waste that pours into recycling centers year-round. Despite all this horror, however, my recollection is that the 2000s were actually kind of a slow period for all of this. Yeah, the web was getting more complex, but it wasn't moving all that fast, and you probably reasonably could have kept a PC for most of the decade. However, the Pentium 4 and the Athlon CPU lines that had launched at the beginning of the decade kept getting faster and faster and faster by orders of magnitude almost. They were becoming incredibly powerful 
and they were outpacing the requirements of average users by leaps and bounds over and over and over. So putting all of this together, in the mid-2000s, this digital revolution is happening, not just with the internet, but with the prevalence of computers in general. And everyone knows that these are improving the quality of life and the convenience of everything everywhere. So everyone wants to get on board. And of course, schools in particular have a strong desire to get these in the hands of every student so that they can be prepped for the coming future, which as we know now, was exactly what they thought it was, a future where everyone is touching a computer at all times. Well, how are you gonna do it? Imagine you're an underfunded school in Detroit or a basically unfunded school in a developing nation, for instance. How are you gonna set up a computer lab for 12 students? I mean, you're gonna spend somewhere between two and $6,000, depending on how low end you go. But even if you go all the way to the bargain basement product available at the time, it's gonna be like a Celeron 2.6, which comparatively speaking, if you're just running Word on it, you've got so much power going to waste. An interesting thing about this is that that's not how it used to be. In 1989, for instance, you could still buy a PC XT compatible clone based on a design from 1981. But in 2004, you couldn't buy a machine that was any older than like 2002, which was still a monster Pentium 4 powerhouse. So how do you get out of this pickle? Well, one of the options, of course, is to buy used. That was available then as it is now, but of course, you're getting a machine that maybe isn't in perfect health and has no warranty. I don't think that Dell and HP had the robust refurbished programs that they have now, so that wasn't a fantastic option. The conventional solution to this problem is the thin client. This is basically a low-powered computer. You plug it into a network, it connects back to a server, and that server gives it its own desktop environment running on that machine along with all the other thin clients. So you've got one server that has a big CPU or multiple CPUs and lots of RAM, and it divides up those resources among all these thin clients. This saves a lot of money both upfront and on maintenance. However, I suspect that if you're working on a low budget, it probably just shuffles the dollars around and doesn't save you that much in the end. To get the most out of this, you want to use dedicated server hardware, which in those days was a lot further away from what you could get in consumer systems than it is nowadays. Multi-core CPUs, multi-CPU sockets, and much higher RAM counts, for instance. In addition, you're going to need a server operating system, and this is not optional. Even if you want to use a consumer PC, you can't connect thin clients to consumer Windows, so you're going to need Windows Server for that. You can do it with Linux, but if you're trying to prep students for the realities of a modern office, they're gonna need Windows. And if you're trying to interoperate with other offices, well, in 2004, Linux isn't gonna fly either. You're also gonna need a network, and those were a lot more expensive back then. You didn't necessarily have one at every single building like you do now. You were gonna need switches, and you were gonna need structured cabling, and you were gonna need somebody to run it all. And this is all noisy and produces a lot of heat, so you're gonna need a closet now, and all of a sudden, you've got all this infrastructure you have to maintain, and you have to buy the thin clients at $100 or more a piece on a good day. Sure, you could skimp in a number of places here, but the point is doing this right was a complicated and expensive prospect and any money you saved up front, you'd probably pay in triplicate later on. Now, I'm not really qualified to talk about this in depth, but I imagine that things were considerably more difficult for developing nations in this regard. For instance, uh, I know that internet access used to be much more limited back then than it is now. So imagine you're in a developing nation and you're trying to set up a simple school computer lab. You just want your students to be able to type up book reports and that sort of thing. You don't have internet access. You have limited access to anything that could take advantage of the full capabilities of these modern powerhouse computers, but they're all you can buy. Now, you're gonna be looking at that and going, why are we gonna spend our entire budget for the year trying to get five or six machines that students can share when just one of them has more power than all of them together can actually use? In short, there was a significant gap. And nowadays it's been filled by computers simply getting incredibly cheap. You can get a modern laptop for under $300 and you can get a refurbed machine with a warranty for under 100. And I mean, if you're really working with a limited budget, I'm sure you can go through some vendor that will load you down with all the express sludge for under 50 bucks a machine. And hey, if it breaks, you can afford to buy another one. That all took a long time to happen, however, so this gap existed for quite some time. In the mid-2000s, there were probably plenty of organizations feeling the burn who would have really loved a simpler, cheaper alternative to, quote, doing it right. So, circa 2003, enter N Computing, a company that wanted to close this gap with a simple, inexpensive solution. A few years later, around 2006 or so, they released that solution. 
the end computing x300. All right, so the box starts right out with a huge claim. It says computing for the next billion people. <laughs> so they're going straight for the gold, right? Then it says that it's been deployed in over 80 countries. Now, if I'm right, if this thing first hit the market in 06 and this box design is from 07, then either end computing is blowing a little smoke or they moved really fast. In other words, maybe it really did fill the gap, but how could whatever's in this little box do that? Well, it's easy. Right here on the front, it tells you, it will liberate the power of your PC with multi-user computing, up to seven users on one PC. Now, that's bold. I'm sure a lot of us have had this thought before. Uh, you know, you can put multiple graphics cards in a PC, right? So why can't you assign one desktop environment to each card? You know, you can have a desktop on both monitors, so why can't you also have a unique mouse and keyboard on each monitor? That way, if you're broke and your little brother wants to use the computer, you can just put another monitor down, turn it around, and he can use it while you use yours. It should be that simple, but you can't do it. You know, Microsoft didn't write it, so it's not doable. That's usually the way it goes with Windows. So, end computing is promising the seemingly impossible here. So what could be inside this little box to change that? There's a lot of stuff here. This, uh, by the way, it says uh, is the three user access terminal kit, but it's actually the seven user, the fully kitted out version. It just happens to fit in the same box for some reason. Uh, by the way, apparently the three user kit was $270. So if we assume there's a small discount, let's guess that the seven user setup was about 500. So keep that number in your mind as we go through all this stuff. So there's a, a bunch of stuff in here. The first component here is the PCI card. We'll go into this in greater depth later, but uh, it's just got two generic chips on it that don't tell you much about what it does and a RAM chip. And then on the end, you've got three RJ45s. And to save you some time, they're not Ethernet. To anyone who's used to looking at weird cards, you'll immediately recognize that this is completely proprietary. Next, uh, we can open up one of these little white boxes and we find the X300 access terminal. This is a real simple unit. We've got a power light on the front, there's no no switches, no controls, nothing, except on the back, you've got an RJ45, VGA, PS2 keyboard and mouse, and audio. On the bottom, there's a label. Uh, it's got the model and the serial number, and that's it. So I've got six of these. Uh, the other one doesn't have a box. It's in this room somewhere. Uh, and then I have two of these PCI cards. Each one accepts uh, three connections. Uh, so that's a total of seven users because whatever this thing does, it doesn't replace the built-in you know, keyboard, mouse, and monitor on the station itself. So six of these devices plus the local console on the machine, that's seven users. There's also a low profile bracket for a small form factor computer. And then of course, you know, we've got the driver disks. For some reason, I ended up with three of them and three sets of instructions. Uh, and of course the instructions are of that, ah uh, yeah, that's how you know something's high quality, right? When it's got the fold out instructions. By the way, I of course ripped the driver disc and put it up on internet archive. Being a good steward. So the back of the box says, all you do is put the PCI card into your computer and then you hook up all the access terminals. And then over here, it says that they all get simultaneous desktop operation. They can all run their own applications. And it says that all you need is a 1.3 gigahertz machine, you know, typical mid-range or low-end options at the time, and that it'll run on Windows or Linux. And the only limitation it states is that it won't run 3D games or full-screen home theater applications. So there's the claims, and that's really all we have, claims. There's no explanation on the box or the manual of how end computing intends to pull this off. It seems like it's gotta be some sort of dirty, filthy trick. I mean, they gotta be cheating, right? Before we get too upset at it, however, let's see what it can do. I just happen to have two monitors, two keyboards, two mice, and the Edge, who, if you're not familiar, you can meet in my previous video. All right, so here's our test fixture. I've got a monitor back here, as well as a keyboard and mouse, which are connected to the PC directly. Uh, on servers, by the way, that's often called the local console, so that's the terminology I'll use. This display here is also mirroring the local console, so you'll see what I'm seeing. This monitor, on the other hand, as well as this keyboard and mouse, are connected to the X300 terminal unit and into the card on the back of the machine. 
So we're both sitting at the login screen, but if you look closely, they're not the same login screen. The text here and here differs. And if I log in, two different wallpapers, two different sets of icons on the desktop, two different start menus. These sure look like two different user accounts. Now, this could be some kind of trickery, right? Like maybe there's a, it's doing some sort of like virtual desktop thing or something like that. It'd be pretty tough because, you know, we actually have our own mouse over here, separate from this one, and Windows just doesn't have support for that. But hey, let's go deeper, right? Let's start Winamp over here, and let's start VLC over there. All right, now both programs are running, but if we go to Task Manager and take a look, Winamp is running as my user, CRD, and VLC is running as X1. So these are definitely separate users, and this isn't some sort of weird virtualization trick, because if we look in my computer, all the same user folders, all the same drives and everything. So, so this is definitely two different sessions on the same machine, same process space and everything. It just works. We're listening to music and we're watching Ren and Stimpy and it's just working somehow, right? I mean, hell, let's, it's 2007, let's start Crisis. Here we go, all right, we're playing Crisis. This is what you did in 2007. This machine can do everything that my 2007 PC could do, just for some reason, somebody can also be watching cartoons on it at the same time, which my 2007 PC couldn't do. It's running Crisis about as well as my PC in 2007 did also. Okay, but seriously though, let's test this uh, uh, kind of formally, right? This thing was intended for, you know, school slash office-y kind of applications, so let's try some of that stuff. Okay, there's Word. Does, does Word have like some default templates or something? All right, there we go. We got two independent words open, which of course isn't all that impressive since, I mean, you can already open multiple copies of Word, right? Yeah, we're gonna open PowerPoint as well. All right, there we go. We got some, some PowerPoint slideshows as well. Same situation. Okay, it runs. Uh, let's get something a little heavier. Here we go, Photoshop. That should put a little strain on it, right? Now you might be asking, would an underfunded school be able to afford Photoshop? Well, yes, if Adobe's marketing people felt like exploiting the educational market that year, or if they pirated it. Photoshop runs just fine on here. You know, it's uh, kind of hard to demo two people working at once when I don't have two people though. So uh, I went ahead and put together a little benchmark script. This guy here uh, just makes a really big image and then does a big expensive rotary blur to it. And let's see how long that takes. Right, that's uh, about 20 seconds. Let's see if we can hit both at once. Eh, eh, click. Hey, 40 seconds. How about that? Just about twice as long, huh? But you know, here's a good place to make a point. Photoshop, like most productivity tools, is not continuous duty, it's intermittent duty. You do big things once in a while that chew up all the CPU power for usually a few seconds at a time, and the rest of the time you're doing little operations, like carefully deleting pixels that might go on for hours but use almost no CPU time. This means that if two people are working on the same machine, but they're not both hitting the radial blur button at the same time, they can probably share the CPU pretty effectively and never really notice any slowdown. So this idea has legs. So far, this is pretty impressive. However it works, it seems to be pulling it off. These are pretty basic office applications though. So what if we hit it a little bit harder? Let's find something that's a bit more of a challenge. Suppose your school doesn't have that much budget, but hey, they've got some camcorders and they wanna do a filmmaking class. Can we do that on here? This thing might be able to run multiple copies of PowerPoint, but video editing has gotta be a bridge too far, right? Well, surprisingly, no, I can actually run two concurrent copies of Adobe Premiere Pro 1.5 on here, and they're way more usable than you'd think. Again, it's kind of hard for me to simulate two people working at once, but uh, I can gin something up here. So here I applied a ripple effect to the video on this one. So it's having to calculate that effect uh, 30 frames a second in real time, right? Which should chew up a good chunk of CPU. But over here on the other one, I can do some edits, delete part of the video, just put in a transition, and now we can play this back and our transition and the video effect happen 
in pretty much real time. There aren't really any hitches or stutters even. And anyone who's used a video editor before will probably be pretty impressed by this because they have a tendency to not be the most optimized pieces of software. Adobe Premiere is kind of notorious for using way more power than it should for simple tasks. Now, this is not a high resolution video. It's a 720 by 480 rip of a VHS videotape. So it's not exactly HD video. By 2007, this was probably a little understated. But still, it's impressive that two people can do it at once. And I imagine there's room to spare. The fact it's not hitching or anything, even though both of these are performing real-time video effects, means you probably could go up in resolution. I just forgot to try. Now, I could run some other software at this point, but I, what could I prove? If this thing can run two copies of Adobe Premiere, then what normal business application could I run that it would struggle with? It's knocked this out of the park, and that was supposed to be my killer, so I don't really know what to do next. I guess the logical next step has to be, can you game on it? It's not for that, and the box outright says that it won't run 3D games or full screen home theater applications, and presumably whatever limitation prevents those from working probably prevents full screen games from working well also. But in 2007, not all games that we were playing were 3D accelerated, and not all games were necessarily full screen. So at least some should work on here. And wouldn't you know it? Some of them do. I had to restrict myself to older titles, but that still left some good stuff. So the first title I tried was Doom 95. You know, it's classic and it'll run on any version of Windows from, well, 95 up, theoretically. Trouble is, for some reason, it fails to switch video modes correctly. So although it does seem to start and run, well, <laughs> it looks like this. And although it is actually running correctly, like the game is running, you can see the, Obviously, the resolution's all wrong and the palette's all wrong. So, you know, I don't even think your, your little brother would be willing to play it like this. So that's a bust, unfortunately. However, by 2007, there were a number of mature Doom source ports that considerably updated and cleaned up the code. And in fact, ZDoom will run on here just fine. So here, for instance, uh, I've got two players in a local multiplayer game. So you and your older brother could, in fact, play Doom together. Although it is hard to play Doom on two keyboards at once, uh, this actually does work perfectly. It's not the fault of the game at all. Doom was pretty old at this point, but we'll chalk this up as a win since it runs perfectly. Moving forward in time a little bit, I tried Quake, which also works fairly well. I couldn't find a working copy of the original WinQuake, uh, so again, I got a source port. This is called a uh, Mark V, and it seems to work just fine. Multiplayer with this one, however, is a little janky. So I can get into a multiplayer game, and it seems to work at first, but it has some weird lag artifacts going on that clearly make it unplayable. As you can see, when player two tries to move around, they jerk and warp all over the place, and they try to actually fight anything, they just get murdered pretty easily. So uh, there's some sort of weird processor affinity bug going on that prevents this from working. Otherwise, it, you know, if whatever bug this is had been patched by this particular source port, uh, I'm sure this would be playable. So there might be another source port out there uh, that makes this work. I just couldn't find one. Now, it doesn't mean that you couldn't both play a single player game. So again, it's useful for letting your little brother share your machine. But, you know, the fact you can't do multiplayer, that's eh, a pretty big bummer. Still, gotta chalk this one up as a win, just not a LAN party win. Now, I didn't try Quake 2 since its code base is very similar to Quake 1. I knew it wouldn't work. And Quake 3 actually requires a 3D accelerator. It was one of the first games that ever did. However, Unreal Tournament, which came out at the same time, didn't. I was astonished to find that it actually runs quick as hell. In 800x600 window mode with the graphics on high, I'm getting over 30 FPS, which is more than playable, and there's no weird lag effects going on. So again, you could totally play UT against your brother. For reasons unbeknownst, the preferences menu only lets you go up to 800x600, but if you hack the EXE, you can get it to run in 1024, which fills the entire screen, even though it won't go full screen for some reason, and you get about 25 FPS, which is Again, fairly playable, although you can see the uh, like weapon animations don't play at this resolution. So really, you got to play it at 800 by 600 in a window, which is a bit of a bummer, but not actually that unusual if you're playing on a budget. So I'm going to chalk this up as a win as well. What about something a little less action oriented? OK, well, how about uh, SimCity 3000? This runs just about fine. Um, it's a little sluggish loading building art for some reason. Like it just occasionally takes a bit to load all that in. but Otherwise, it runs okay. It's not a multiplayer game, of course, but you know, if, again, if you and your brother both wanted to play SimCity, then you could do it. 
This is also something I can sort of imagine being on deck at a school computer lab anyway. And of course, it strongly suggests that edutainment titles like Oregon Trail that just have simple two-dimensional graphics would probably also run fine. So everything's kind of coming up Millhouse so far. It's not the best offering. I mean, <laughs> these are all pretty old games, but I remember being broke and desperate. If I could have had a LAN party with a bunch of friends, even if we had to play old games, I would have gone for it. So this is still pretty cool. Trouble is, I'm cherry picking here. Most of the stuff you really wanted to run out of LAN probably wouldn't have run. For instance, look what happens when I try to start StarCraft. It seemed like this game would be a slam dunk. You know, it's old, it's two-dimensional, but it's a native Windows game, and it's a great LAN party option, even in 2007, but on the X300, it pops this cryptic error message about not being able to set the video mode. Now, this is the third game we've seen with weird video problems, whether it's rendering incorrectly, or failing to recognize all available resolutions, or failing to start at all. There's some weird problem going on with video here. What could be causing it? Well, this is, of course, going to be another of my videos where I tell you that I can't say for sure how any of this works, and what you're going to hear is going to be a mix of guesswork and extrapolation from the few hard facts I could pin down. Uh, if anyone has any solid inside info, I'd love to hear it, but I scoured the internet, torn apart the software as best I could, and all I really have are tidbits. There is one thing I am sure of. This is not a virtualization trick. Doing this with VMs at this time on this hardware in this part of the country, localized entirely to your kitchen, was not possible. There were no virtualization specific features in the P4 as I recall, and even if there were, if you were running two or God forbid six XP VMs on this machine, it would have started glowing. The CPU overhead would have been inconceivable, not to mention seven OSs reading and swapping with a single pre-SSD spinning disk. The whole thing would have run like a fleet of 386s for about 10 minutes before it melted straight through the floor. Virtualization is cool, but in this era it was a hammer and this machine would have crumbled under its blow. I may not know exactly how the end computing works, but I am positive it's doing something considerably more nuanced. And as usual, I'm going to take you through the whole agonizing process of how I determined that. As is traditional, let's make a short story long. Probably not surprisingly, none of this works out of the box. You put the cards in your machine and get some exclamation points in Device Manager and that's it. No picture. After you install the drivers, the terminal comes on, but it just displays this waiting for startup message. You have to go install the control software before it can do anything. In order to install the software and activate the devices, you have to enter the serial number from the bottom of each device, which is a weird form of DRM. I can't figure it out. Why do you have to prove that you have the device when you couldn't use the device if you didn't have it? It's weird. With the software installed, when the PC powers up, the terminal now shows the login. But let's take a look at the management software. If we get into the management app from the sys tray here, this is kind of cute. It actually turns out to be a, a snap in for the Microsoft management console. This is a, a funny thing. Microsoft added MMC in like Windows 2000. And I believe the idea is that if your program is meant to be deployed to like an enterprise network, MMC has all these built-in features for like multi-computer management where you can just connect to another machine and anything that's in MMC, you'll be able to control remotely. So it makes sense if end computing was thinking these would be deployed in sort of a fleet configuration that you might want to be able to manage them all from a central admin location but it's still really funny because there's very little software that I've seen that bothered to do this, even where it made a lot of sense. Anyway, under local settings here, you can see all the stations I've configured. I only have one right now, uh, but you can get in here and uh, you can stop it. So you can shut it down completely if you don't want somebody to use it, uh, or you can send a message to the user on that station. You can also descend down into the station and see the details about it. So for instance, what user is logged in. If I log in here, bam, there we go, X1 is in there now. We can also go to the application loaded and this will show us every process that's running under that user. Under station settings, you can give them names, um, you can have it not turn the station on when the machine starts, so somebody has to ask permission basically before they can use a station. Um, you can enable auto log on so they all come up directly into a particular user. Uh, you can even have it uh, limit the programs they can run to just one application. This is something that's built into Windows. Uh, these are just convenient shortcuts for it, but they make a lot of sense, right? Because you might have sort of a kiosk set up, like a you know, library computer for small kids where they can come in, they sit down at the machine, and it's just always running the same program. Information and settings has a bunch of information, uh, and it also has these system settings, but we'll come back to those in a moment. USB device assignments. This is interesting. So 
If you think about it, the host machine here it has a number of USB ports on it. So when you plug something in, who should that device appear for? Because if it appears for everyone, that could be a problem. For instance, uh, I just plugged in a USB drive, and if we wait a moment, there's the auto run, and you can see the auto run is on there as well. So both of these users can see that device, they can both interact with it, and you might not want that. Suppose you're on a machine where a bunch of students are taking a test and the teacher has plugged in a USB drive that contains the test information, including the answers. If everyone can read the drive, well, you know how kids are. Anything you leave out, they're going to find. So there's a solution to this. You can go down here to available USB ports and then dig down to the particular device that you want. Here we go, mass storage device. And then you can say uh, that you want this device to only appear on the main console. And now it won't show up on any of the stations. It seems you can do this with any kind of USB device. Uh, so you could get really granular with this. You know, you could do something like, uh, you could set up three teams of two people on one machine and then give each team access to a USB drive that they're storing their project information on. Or if you did have multiple people editing video on one machine, maybe you have video capture cards that are specific to each workstation. Keyboards and mice work a little differently, uh, so they get broken out into their own section. You can come in here and go to user detection. So basically if you've got you know, six keyboards and six mice, you wanna figure out which one goes with which station, uh, you can use this to, you, know, you move the keyboard, move the mouse, and it figures out which one it is, and you can assign it to a station that way. You can also select a keyboard and go in and tell it to blink all the lights on it so you can identify it when you've got a whole mess of them plugged in. They also have a separate section for audio devices. So if you're, say, running a bunch of audio workstations, you've got a bunch of DACs hooked up, you can assign those to individual workstations as well. So this is a pretty rich feature set. I could see how this could have been a lot more limited and disappointing, but they've actually provided for an enormous number of interesting use cases you could do just about anything you'd want to do with this system. But let's go back to the system settings because I want to show you something there. There's a bunch of global options here. They're largely self-explanatory, nothing really interesting, except for one, X300 card video mode settings. See, if you go into the display properties on the X300 here, it only lists one available resolution and one available color depth. You have to change them from this menu here, which contains two options. 1024 by 768 at 60 hertz or 800 by 600 at 75 hertz. Let me be crystal here. These devices support those two modes and nothing else, which is very strange. Graphics cards aren't normally like that, but this one can't run at 800 by 600 at 32 bit color or 1024 by 768 at 256 colors. And it can't switch modes on the fly and it can't run at 640 by 480. This is a bizarre limitation. Every graphics card since 1987 could support 640 by 480. It was universal after IBM put out the first PS2. This is the only thing I've ever seen that can't do it. And this is why StarCraft wouldn't launch because that game just assumes that your card could do 640 by 480. So all the art in the game is designed for that resolution and it won't run in a window. It'll only run full screen and at that res and color depth. And it's not alone. 640 by 480 8-bit color was a pretty common requirement for a lot of titles, including a lot of edutainment titles. If you go back to a lot of that old, uh, you know, full motion video quick time stuff, the, the sort of castle explorer and things like that, um, it tries to launch in 640 by 480, 256 colors. Well, that's always going to fail on this device. So end computing really sort of shot themselves in the foot here by not solving whatever problem causes this. This limitation was wacky in 2007, but I think it'll make a little more sense once we take a look at the hardware. So once again, here's the X300 card, a mystery by any measure. Uh, we can sort of pick it apart, but not much. Uh, first off, we've got a big old chip with a sticker on it. Now here's a tip for you. If you're looking at a piece of hardware that you don't know anything about, it's got a big chip with a sticker on it, it's almost certainly an FPGA. This is a thing companies do. That big sticker is them trying to brand a generic component because FPGAs are a type of chip that has no inherent function. You can program them to be anything you want, billions and billions of possibilities. That means there's no way for me to find out what this chip actually does. I can look up the part number on it, but that's just gonna tell me that it's an FPGA. I don't know how people reverse engineer these, if you can like slurp the code out of them or what, but with my limited capabilities, I have no idea what this thing does inside. 
Fortunately, it betrays some of its functionality through the operating system. When you first install this and boot up, you see a device show up in Device Manager called a bridge. Uh, this is a PCI bridge, uh, something that plugs into a PCI slot and splits it out like a hub to let you plug in more devices. They're almost always part of a card that has multiple functions on it. And indeed, when you install the driver for the bridge, it disappears and three video adapters appear in its place. After you install the drivers for those, they show up as ordinary displays. See, if I go into display properties, I've got an eight head machine now. This is actually an advertised feature. N Computing has a video on YouTube where they explain that if you don't install the additional N Computing software that makes these do all their magic, you can just use them for additional desktops. You can put two of these in a machine, which gives you six 1024 by 768 displays for under $600, which is actually pretty cool. So I think it's safe to say that one of the things this FPGA is doing is acting as a low-end triple head graphics card, which explains quite a few things. The graphics aren't being rendered entirely in software, nor by my Radeon 9550. They're being rendered by whatever GPU core they could fit three of into one low-end FPGA, which probably wasn't much, especially in 2007. I'm also guessing this is why it can't switch resolutions on the fly. They probably used some very bare bones FPGA GPU cores that they got pre-made from somebody that didn't have all the sophistication of a real graphics card. They were probably intended for embedded applications or something. So instead of having all of the capabilities you expect, like changing resolutions and auto detecting the monitor and stuff like that, it just has two hard coded paths in the code that powers the FPGA. And they're probably just sending it one command to switch between the two. This is also certainly why there's no 3D capabilities. You could probably make a 3D accelerator in an FPGA nowadays, but in 2007, no way. In addition to the three video devices, it also installed three sound devices that I didn't have to pick drivers for. I'm guessing that's because they're based on the AC97 standard, which Windows probably had a generic driver for. There's oddly no interfaces that I can see for the additional keyboards and mice on the interface boxes. So that's kind of spooky. I'm not sure how they did that. So that's all we get from the card. I think we know what the FPGA does. Uh, I'm sure the RAM chip is just for video RAM. Uh, and this guy here turns out to be a thing called a CPLD, a complex programmable logic device. It's sort of like an older, less sophisticated brother to the FPGA. Um, I think they do a lot less. I don't know what that one does for sure either, but I looked at the data sheet and it says that it makes a good PCI interface. So I'm guessing that's what's acting as the PCI bridge. So those are all the answers we can get from the card. Let's take a look at the terminal adapter. So the insides of this thing don't explain much either, but they do rule out a lot since there's really not much in here. There's another CPLD and very little else. Some power supply components and some passives and that's it. So right away, I'm sure this isn't any kind of thin client. I don't believe CPLDs are sophisticated enough to host that sort of thing, but more importantly, it doesn't have any kind of internal state. If I unplug the cable while this is running, it shuts off, but when I plug it back in, it picks right back up where it was. It doesn't have to reconnect and renegotiate a session. In addition, if I just move the cable to another port on the card, it picks up a different session. I also found that if you don't have a PS2 mouse connected when you start the machine up, you can't just unplug this thing in order to connect one. It still won't work until you restart the machine. So that suggests that the PS2 mouse controller is actually back in the card, which is where I think all the intelligence is. I'm pretty sure that the card hosts everything and this device is just a fancy breakout box. But that raises a different question. If all the intelligence is in the card, then how do all those signals get to the box? Because there aren't enough pins in a Cat5 cable. There's only eight and there's quite a few more signals than that here. VGA alone needs five signals, uh, red, green, blue, and then horizontal and vertical sync. Uh, then you need, I, I don't remember, I think it's two to four pins each for the PS2 ports and then uh, at least two pins for the audio port, and that all adds up to like 11 pins. So something here is doing double duty, but that CPLD I don't think is complex enough to generate a video signal all on its own. I don't see the parts I would expect for that. Fortunately, that part is easy to explain. The video signals are actually being sent over the Cat5 cable raw. If you trace all the pins in the RJ45 connector, you'll discover that three of them go through a couple resistors and then straight over to the VGA port. So that's why the cable length per the manual can't be any longer than about 15 feet, because if you're just shooting analog VGA over an unshielded cable, you can't run it very far. I found two other pins were carrying plus five volts and ground, which leaves three, 
And while I'm not that great with an oscilloscope, so I couldn't check this, I suspect that two of them are carrying the horizontal and vertical sync pulses for the VGA port. I just couldn't find them on the board. And the remaining one carries the PS2 keyboard and mouse and the audio signals in a serial digital format, which the CPLD is unpacking. I suspect that some of these resistors that you see next to the CPLD are being used as a sort of a, a ladder DAC to reproduce the audio. Probably looks terrible on a distortion meter, but you know it's good enough for desktop boops and bonks. So in other words, if N Computing had been willing to spring for custom cables with like 11 or 13 wires, this thing might not have contained any active electronics at all. It would just be a breakout box. So at this point, I don't think the hardware is providing any of the magic here. At first, I assumed that at least the card itself had to have some kind of secret sauce in it, but at this point, I don't think so. I think this is just a triple head graphics card, triple head sound card, and so on. I think it's a completely generic piece of hardware that just has a lot of them in one trench coat and all the magic is happening in software. As far as the software goes, things are pretty scant. End Computing wasn't talking about how it worked back in the day. I can't find any white papers or documentation, really nothing that alludes to how this functions under the hood. I haven't found any websites that talk about how it works, and the only real hints I've gotten have been from friends who shall remain nameless to protect the guilty because they can't remember where they got that info. However, armed with the preconceptions they gave me, I think I've been able to nail this down. It all begins with Windows Terminal Services. That's the component of Windows that allows multiple users, like multiple thin clients or remote desktop sessions, to connect to one Windows server and have independent desktop environments. Many of you have probably used this. If you've ever used remote desktop for your job, that's the same thing. In fact, the name of the file is mstsc.exe, which stands for Microsoft Terminal Services Client. Now, Terminal Services has never been shipped in a consumer version of Windows, at least not in its full fat form. Prior to Windows XP, it was actually impossible on any non-server version of Windows to have multiple user sessions going at once. You couldn't detach your current session, that is, leave all your programs running, and allow someone else to use your computer and then return to your session later. There just weren't any components for that. But when Microsoft merged their product lines, when they made Windows XP the first consumer version of Windows NT, they realized that the Terminal Services server was now available in the consumer code base and that there was something consumery they could do with that. They still didn't want more than one person using a copy of Windows at any given time, but they realized that a lot of families were sharing machines and that was really inconvenient. So they added a feature called fast user switching, which is what allows you to log out of one account, leaving all your stuff running so that someone else in your family can log into the same machine, do whatever they need to do, and then you can go back to your stuff later. This was very rudimentary multi-user computing, but it was implemented by bringing the entire terminal services code base into consumer Windows. That means that suddenly XP had things like the graphics remoting system, which is what allows Windows to redirect the video from a desktop session, as well as all the input for that session and shove it down a network pipe. Interesting thing about that is that it supports multiple different types of clients. You can have software like the remote desktop client, hardware like a thin client, or an internal module in Windows like fast user switching. That, I believe, is how this all comes together. My guess is that the end computing software acts as a terminal services client. It connects back to the machine it's running on and starts multiple terminal services sessions. But instead of connecting those over the network, it turns around and patches them into the X300 hardware driver so that the video and input goes to the card. I found evidence of this in a few places. Uh, the manual does use the phrase terminal services in a few places. Although that's kind of generic and it's not capitalized, so that's not really conclusive. However, in the configuration utility, there's a checkbox that says, use WTS API 32, which is the Windows Terminal Services API. And when I look at the strings in the executables and DLLs that make up the end computing software, I find references to the Terminal Services registry entries and APIs. So I'm pretty sure my hypothesis is correct, especially because I can't see how else they could have done this. So in other words, it is a thin client solution. It's just even thinner than usual. A normal thin client contains basically all the components of a normal PC. That's power supply, CPU, RAM, and then all the peripherals, video, audio, and so on. This approach saves a lot of money by cutting out about half of those. You only need the peripherals. The power supply and RAM and CPU are provided by the host machine you're already on. So they solved the thin client problem by making an even thinner client. It's very tidy, I suppose, except this shouldn't be possible. XP is not a server OS, so it doesn't contain terminal services. 
Yes, I know I said it has the code, but it's a well-known fact that consumer Windows contains like 85% of the features that are in the server versions of Windows. They're just all turned off. Microsoft could have released a 10 kilobyte patch to let Windows XP act as a terminal server, and they didn't because they want money. As proof of this, if you buy any professional version of Windows, XP Pro, 7 Pro, 10 Pro, it has a slightly less restricted terminal services server. You can connect to any modern Pro version of Windows with the remote desktop client. However, it'll kick out your local desktop session when you do this. Microsoft relaxed a little bit to let you connect to these OSs remotely, but they still won't let you put two people on one computer at once. Microsoft wants to get paid for every single pair of hands that is using Windows at any given moment. Not only does Microsoft make you buy the more expensive Windows server, but you can't just hook 50 users up to it. You have to buy client access licenses, which are pretty expensive. In other words, while the components of terminal services are in Windows XP, you are not allowed to use them. And that means that end computing did a big bad. Looking at the original XP license, it says, you may install one copy of the product on a single computer, except as otherwise permitted below, you may not permit any device to use, access, display, or run other executable software, nor run the product or product's user interface unless the device has a separate license for the product. This and other verbiage basically means that you can run programs on your PC, but you can't let anybody else run them on your PC at the same time. This does suggest it might be legal to connect a bunch of clients to XP if you purchased them with licenses, even if they weren't running the OS themselves. But I imagine this is probably disallowed elsewhere in the EULA. And besides that, end computing probably had to modify parts of Windows that deal with licensing, which was very likely a violation in itself. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know if that's really what this means, but the important thing is that their intent is clear. That's why it's remarkable to me that despite my conviction that end computing defied Microsoft, violated their license, and delivered a product that hacked their OS to cheat them out of hundreds or thousands of extra licenses, they didn't seem to get caught doing it. Maybe they thought they could work within the law here because technically this isn't really a separate device, right? Because it's inside your computer and that makes it all one device, right? I'm absolutely positive that if they'd gotten sued, Microsoft lawyers would have just pointed at these two things and the judge would have banged his gavel and it would have been over. They would have lost because Microsoft wanted them to lose and that's all that matters. If you are not a Fortune 500 and a business decides that you can't do what you're doing, you lose. Deleting your Nintendo ROMs after 24 hours or owning actual cartridges doesn't make you any less guilty of software piracy because Nintendo says you are. This is always how it's been. So end computing had no power here except that Microsoft chose not to destroy them and I have no idea why. I couldn't find any articles about them getting sued and the product stayed on the market for a really long time before being replaced with similar variations. And this entire time, they showed some consciousness of guilt. I mean, if you poke around on their website, uh, in 2009, they actually had a disclaimer up there that said that you did have to have multiple copies of the Windows license, which of course is totally bogus. Um, but it was clear that they, they knew that this was actually a violation and they were trying to cover their asses. See the, the XP license actually says, uh, Windows client operating system does not permit licensing a multi-user solution, right? So that didn't work, it wasn't valid. But it doesn't matter, right? Because it's just CYA, they're just covering their asses. If end computing can plausibly say, well, it's the user's problem to not use it in an illegal way, and the users are too small individually to get noticed by Microsoft, then everyone wins, right? And if it's not clear, I'm completely behind them on this. If you're in a country or a school district that's completely broke because all your money is being sapped away by capitalist assholes, then yeah, buddy, steal all you can carry. I salute end computing as heroes of the revolution. On the other hand, uh, however, wouldn't true heroes of the revolution have supported Linux as well? I mean, they say they do. The box says they do, the manual says they do, their website says they do, but there's no software on the disk for Linux. The manual doesn't have any instructions for Linux. It all just says Windows. and even if they did make Linux software, uh, given that this thing apparently has some form of DRM, since it asks you for the serial numbers on the device and then tries to phone home with them for some reason, I would guess that they never would have made an actual open source version of it because then people could defeat that DRM. Uh, so whatever they did make would probably have been a binary blob compiled for like a couple ancient crusty versions of a couple ancient crusty distributions. And from what little info I found on ancient forum posts and whatnot, that does seem to be the case. It looks like they never really delivered on this. 
And the odd thing about that is it doesn't seem like it would have required that much effort. I mean, Linux already has this baked in, going all the way back to the Unix days, multi-user remote desktop, as we would think of it now, was always there. The only thing end computing had to do was write some X modules to support this device uh, and to add you know, user management stuff so you could make decisions about where to assign USB devices and, and things like that. This wasn't a big lift. And the only reason I can think that they didn't do it is because they were a janky fly-by-night company that made promises they later realized were inconvenient to keep. And hey, who can blame them for being a little janky? They made a product that makes remote desktop connections to itself. It's cutting out a middleman that there were probably good reasons not to cut out. Uh, it's also using computer hardware for purposes it wasn't intended for, and it's several types of illegal. So we can't get too upset at it. No, let's focus on what matters. It doesn't matter if it's legal or legit or makes sense. The question is, does it do what it says it can do? If you actually tried to run a computer lab off of this thing, could it do it? Well, to figure that out, we're going to need six of them. I've got six full terminals here, uh, including six keyboards and six mice up there that are really hard to get to. And I've put them all through their paces and I've just been astonished at the results. In fact, the results are so impressive that I have to sort of disclaimerize them before we continue. I spent like two days going through all the tests for this thing and I wrote a script where I said that you can run productivity applications on all six terminals at once. They're not fooling, it really does work, but you know they bog down fairly easily. So you really have to keep it light. If you fly too close to the sun, you get burned. Any attempt to really tax the machine with a heavy Photoshop workload or God forbid a video game would bring it to its knees instantly. But of course that made sense because this wasn't made for that, right? So it, it all made sense at first. And then as I kept working on it, I started to get suspicious because it really seemed like it was tapping out too early. I'm running this all off of my PC that I call the Edge. And when I got that system, it wasn't super hot. It was a Pentium 4 2.53 gigahertz with a 533 front side bus, a really old motherboard that took two different types of RAM uh, and no hyper threading. So not really a hot system at all, but that was kind of on purpose. I wanted to use something that represented sort of a bargain basement or, or even uh, just a machine you had sitting around in 2007 because you know, you're trying to put together a computer lab and you're just using whatever you have and the only investment you're making in new parts is the end computing cards themselves. And I figured this machine with its limited front side bus and not nearly top of the line CPU frequency was a perfect candidate. So I figured things would be slow, but I expected that. And I wanted to illustrate that you could take even a, a lower end machine and turn it into something sluggish, but workable, better than nothing. But it just seemed too slow. It was taking five solid minutes for all users to log in. And even with a single spinning hard disk and whatnot, that seemed too slow to me. I was running PowerPoint presentations on all six displays at once, and when I would hit the button to advance, they would actually take like a second or two, and animations were jerky and slowed down and whatnot. Photoshop sort of did okay, but it, like it was really dragging on simple operations, and if I launched Adobe Premiere on two terminals at once, it would actually hang the machine. After a couple days of this, I was just sick of it. I thought, you know, maybe the CPU isn't fast enough. Maybe you just couldn't do this, and what fun is a video like that? Or maybe the motherboard was damaged. Maybe it had dead cap syndrome and I just couldn't see it because the caps hadn't po actually popped yet. So I roll over to the RePC and I dug up a new motherboard and CPU. Okay, not new by any measure. And I upgraded the machine to a P4 3.2 with hyperthreading. And in the process of doing so, I discovered that one of the latches on the heat sink had been broken. So the machine had probably been thermal throttling this whole time because it had no effective heat sinking. Unfortunately, by the time I discovered this, I'd already finished the rebuild. So it was a bit of a bummer because I wanted to do this on a lower end machine, uh, but I checked and the 3.2 chip came out in 2003, it looks like. So it's not that new. You know, it was four years old when this box came out. So maybe it was on the used market for a reasonable price at that point. And either way, it's just a little more fun to see what this thing can do if you did have a higher end system. And from these results, you can sort of extrapolate what you could do if you had a, an actual top of the line system from that era. What could that get you versus buying six separate high end machines? So first things first, logging in on all six stations at once takes under two minutes. Uh, and given that it's loading the NT profile for six users off of the same spinning disk, that's actually kind of impressive. SSDs weren't really a thing yet, so this is representative. 
The Office apps launch instantaneously and run just fine. I don't think that's too terribly shocking. Running six copies of PowerPoint is actually not that abnormal. But I was able to put the same slideshow up on all six screens and advance to it as quickly as I could hit the spacebar. And of course, to test that, I had to kneel on the floor trying to stay out of shot while madly playing whack-a-mole with six different keyboards, trying to figure out how my life ended up here. Photoshop does take a couple minutes to launch if you fire it up on all sessions at once, uh, but once it settles down, it runs pretty zip quick, as if only one user were on the machine. I did try running that benchmark script from earlier, and it completes in about two and a half minutes, which is about six times slower than the single user performance. Who saw that one coming? Also, if you recall, I mentioned these boxes have audio jacks on them, and sure enough, there's independent audio for each desktop. So if your task requires sound, that does work. So these basic tests haven't really told us anything we didn't already know, especially since you can already run multiple copies of Photoshop or PowerPoint on your machine already. A lot of us probably have. So I wasn't expecting any surprises from this next test, and as a result, the outcome obliterated me. I launched Adobe Premiere on all six terminals at once and prepared for the computer to evaporate into a mist. Instead, it ran with a quickness that I still cannot fully wrap my head around. Like I said earlier, video editing is a heavy task, and Premiere is not the lightest way to go about it, but somehow it actually works, and, and works well. Again, I, I can't simulate six people working on the same machine realistically, since I only have two hands, and thanks to the accident, the one brain, but I devised some experiments. For instance, uh, I can start a render on one session, which should, by all rights, hang all the others, because it sucks up as much CPU power and memory as it possibly can. But then I can go to the other sessions and I can scrub around the timeline and place edits and it actually works. I wouldn't have expected that at all. So I stopped the render and I tried hitting play on all six timelines at once, thinking that there was no way they would be able to keep up because they have to stream the video data off the hard drive in six separate streams simultaneously. That should completely smash the IO performance of the machine. And yeah, it does, but not as bad as I expected. They don't play it anywhere close to real time, but they do play. And in fact, in reality, you'd never have six people hitting play at the same moment, except once in a long while. In reality, you'd have some people editing and some people playing at any given moment. And in fact, if I stop three of the players, the other three actually pick up to nearly real time. I don't think it's quite 30 FPS, but it's close. It's more than usable. I can have two sessions playing, and in the third one, I can go through, place edits, put in some transitions, and I can preview those and it all actually works fairly smoothly, which means you could actually do this. You could put six people on here and with a normal like stochastic distribution of effort where people are doing different tasks at different times, nobody's hitting the same button simultaneously on all six systems, I think it would actually work. And that's stunning, especially given that this is not an optimized setup. Even without spending much more money, you could still make huge improvements on this. Because again, it's streaming all that video data off of just one hard drive. If you put just one more hard drive in there, it would spread out the I.O. load so much that I think you'd get a lot better performance. So while I doubt end computing expected this sort of application, it works much better than anyone could have anticipated. And the funny thing about this is uh, it would save you a lot of money, not just in hardware, but in software as well, if you were a little sketchy. Because see, I didn't activate seven copies of Adobe Premiere. Every time you install it, it asks you to activate with Adobe. It phones home and makes sure that nobody else has used this license. Well, after I activated it on one session, all the others just worked. So if you're a school that's really hurting for money, you could divide one Adobe license among seven students without having to delve into the world of actual software piracy and hunt down a crack. That may not be something end computing wanted to encourage, and it may not be advisable legally for an institution, but hey, sometimes practicality reigns. I would guess this did happen if for no other reason, then there's no way to actually do it correctly. If you try and install another copy of Premiere, it just says it's already installed. So if anybody did use Adobe products in this sort of configuration, it was impossible for them to follow the license terms to the letter. And in my opinion, more power to them.
So the productivity software pretty much runs circles around itself, and I think this device has proven all its points. But before we talk about the implications of that, we got to go back to the video games question. Is this a LAN party in a box? Well, maybe, probably not, though. Um, two players is sort of okay, but after that, it gets progressively worse. For instance, here's seven Space Marines in one Z-Doom trench coat, and while they are all connected and they can interact with each other, the frame rate is atrocious. It's like less than 10. I tried doing everything I could to fix this. I lowered the internal rendering resolution, I shrank the viewport, and there was no improvement. So while Doom is fairly forgiving, it's got this sort of play slow but looks fast design methodology that makes it more playable than you'd expect at this frame rate, we gotta chalk this one up as a failure. Quake suffers quite a bit more, and in stranger ways. You can run two sessions, uh, sort of janky, but if you try to run more, they actually won't launch, and I don't know why. Anything after the first two sessions will just sit there, running in Task Manager but not going anywhere, and it bogs the system down super bad, so that the games that are running have really, really high apparent ping. And then if I close one of the running sessions, another one will open up, and if I close that one, another one will open up, and so on. So some sort of weird flocking thing going on here that I don't understand. So this one is a complete failure. Maybe another source port would work better, but I couldn't find one. But this seems to be a problem with Quake specifically because Unreal Tournament ran really impressively, like a lot better than I would have expected. I mean, it's not amazing, but if you've got two or three players in a match and you're running 640 by 480 windows, you can actually get 30 FPS in all three sessions at times. It's not consistent, but it's a lot better than you'd expect. It's not great, but it is playable. And you could probably add a fourth player if you had the host playing on a 3D accelerator. I didn't try that. Now, if you increase the resolution, it gets bad fast. At 1024, three players will be running at like less than 10 FPS. And if you wanna have all six players, you're gonna have to drop to 640 by 480 and turn down the graphics settings if you wanna get anything faster than like eight FPS. And even so, it's not a whole lot of fun. A funny thing about this though is when I'm doing this, one of the sessions will always have twice the FPS of all the others. So like one will be at 30 while all the others are at 15. My guess is that whichever session I start first gets assigned to one of the Pentium 4's sort of virtual cores, and then all the following ones get assigned to the other one by the hyper-threading scheduler. I don't know if that's really how the P4 works, but it's the only thing I can think of. So UT is not quite a LAN party option, but with only three players and low graphics settings, it might be okay. At this point, I was thinking, you know, these games may be old, but they were all cutting edge when they came out. What if I found something that was intended to be lower spec? So I dredged up a copy of Fury 3, which is a, a really old 3D sort of combat flight simulator thing. It's a spiritual successor to Terminal Velocity, a DOS game, but it came out for Windows in about 1995, and I believe it was written with the very old pre-DirectX WinG API. So it'll actually run on Windows 3.1, I'm told. And surprise, surprise, I can run six copies on here and they all run playably. It's not a multiplayer game, but it suggests that there might be other 3D titles out there, not so mainstream, that would actually work in this configuration. So with the 3D games aside, I went back and tried SimCity 3000, thinking that would run like a dream. Uh, and surprisingly, it actually doesn't. After two or three players, the machines start to bog down super bad. At six players, it's completely unplayable. Now, I suspect this isn't a graphics thing so much as it's just the simulation being very computationally intense. I was thinking SimCity 2000 might work better, but that one refuses to run on multiple sessions at once for some reason. That said, there are lots of other games that probably would. Anything that's two-dimensional and runs in a window is probably a candidate and would run just fine, and that happens to include virtually all edutainment software. So again, a school could load this up with Oregon Trail and everyone would have a great time. These are remarkable results. The Pentium 4 is not thought of as a powerhouse by modern standards, but I feel I've demonstrated that even now, it would be adequate for a lot of computer lab tasks. Up until you hit it with things that didn't exist back then, like HD video or modern video games, I think it would actually kick ass. And hell, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this would eat HD video if it were in a sufficiently powerful machine. In 2007, you could get a Core 2 Duo or a Quad, or hey, maybe you could scrounge up a Xeon on the used market, and maybe that would eat multiple HD video sessions at once. If you're interested in finding out, let me know. Maybe I'll track down a machine and we'll do this again. But as fun as it is to think about the high end, what I think is remarkable is that this machine is still massively overpowered for what I'm doing with it. For those basic productivity tasks, you could actually do this on a Pentium 3. I tested on my Dell 800 megahertz, and it actually could run multiple concurrent sessions of most of this software. It couldn't do Premiere, 
and it struggles with Photoshop, but again, it would fall over the moment you pointed it at the internet. But if you're not doing that, you're not doing HD video, et cetera, a Pentium 3 could actually survive in a modern computer lab. If a P3800 can serve the purposes of multiple office workers at once, then we've been throwing money into a pit for decades. When you walked into a computer lab in 2004 and were surrounded by Pentium 4s, that was like standing in a room full of freighter engines being used to sharpen pencils. The waste was absurd. Most computer labs could be served well by a couple mid-range machines or like one or two high-end machines if only the software would let you do what is obviously possible. I'm sure they didn't intend it, but end computing was doing something righteous by blowing past Microsoft's arbitrary restrictions and allowing organizations to use the full capabilities of their massively overpowered systems when they had previously been forced to spend fortunes they didn't have on machines they didn't need. One of the dangling questions is why this didn't become more common. I've already talked to a few people who have seen them in use before, but I've never seen one. Every computer lab I've ever seen was fully decked out with individual workstations. This seems like a solid solution. Why didn't it show up basically everywhere? I have no idea, and I also think it could have gone further than schools. I think end computing left a lot of money on the table by not trying to sell this to families. Imagine if you could buy a dual or triple head setup so that two kids in the family could have their own PC without actually having their own PC. It would have sold like hotcakes. Of course, they might have been just too busy with success because they went on to make more and different models after this. There was the X350, which seems to be the same thing, just with a newer card design. Then there was the X550, which could do five users per card for a total of 11 users per machine. Later, they switched away from direct attached devices and started selling the L series, which is a more conventional network attached device. Uh, so it's more like a thin client, but I, I think they were still selling the hacked terminal services software. And nowadays, they're actually still around selling thin clients based on Raspberry Pis that connect back to a virtualization system on your PC. One of my favorite parts of this timeline is that in the middle of it, they produced a product that tops the charts in terms of a baffling thing to find at the thrift store. They partnered with LG, uh, specifically LG India, to produce a monitor that embedded one of their thin clients. So this was like the thinnest of clients. You could buy this monitor that had an RJ45 on the back and then plug it into a card on your PC and you'd have like six or 10 people clustered around this machine with just monitors with keyboards and mice going into them. The fact that they actually got a major corporation to partner with them for this is astonishing to me. And you know, it's not even like they didn't have competition. This was actually kind of a bustling little industry. I just picked this product because I had it. Uh, there was a company called Twinsoft, I believe, uh, from Singapore that produced a product called B-Twin. Uh, and there was another one from Russia called Aster uh, that have similar claims, but as I understand it, they don't require the custom hardware. They'll work with any graphics card and any keyboard, mouse, et cetera, in your machine. So that's pretty cool. There's also a company called Miniframe that made something called SoftExpand. Uh, that seems to be very similar as well, except I found an article about this one that says that, yes, they were hacking terminal services. And it came to the conclusion that it was legal, although I don't know how they did that. It doesn't say in the article. There was another company called Userful that delivered something similar for Linux. Again, that seems like a really light lift. You'd think it would be common, but I can't find any info on how it worked and I can't find a copy of the software. If anybody has one or knows where to get it, let me know, I'd love to try it out. The most intriguing product in this space, however, was actually from Microsoft. Windows Multipoint Server was a version of Windows Server that did this same thing. I guess Microsoft just kind of hacked out their own limitations. This came out in, I think, 2008 or so, and I'm guessing Microsoft just realized the reality of the situation that not everyone could afford their very expensive operating system, and they'd rather collect some license fees than none. So this offered a native, fully legitimate way to connect up to 20 terminals to one machine, again, using commodity hardware, graphics cards, keyboards, mice, you provide it yourself. I don't know much about Multipoint's performance or features, but I'm guessing it's considerably slicker than the other ones since, hey, Microsoft has full control of the OS, right? Uh, in fact, a friend of mine who's used it says that you can actually use it in split screen mode with two desktops sharing one monitor. That sounds so cool that I just went to eBay and bought a copy. So <laughs> I'll have a video about that eventually. Multipoint persisted for a few years. Uh, it eventually got rolled into Windows Server as a feature, and then it disappeared after Server 2016, I believe, probably because Microsoft realized that computers had gotten so cheap that this wasn't really necessary anymore. Still, I'm really interested in seeing how it performed. And if you are too, uh, if you'd like to see more about this, uh, let me know in the comments. And in fact, B-Twin and Aster both appear to still be for sale. So maybe I'll pick those up at some point, do a big comparison between Multipoint Server and the other offerings it competed with. Who knows? But for now, that's all I've got.
If you're new to the channel and you enjoyed this, maybe you thought, wow, this guy is really trying too hard. I like that. Please subscribe for more. Remember to turn on notifications. YouTube is just like that. If you really enjoyed this, consider supporting me on Patreon at the link below, much like all these folks appearing on your screen now, or appearing on these screens now. This was a really hard video to make. I had to put in a lot of effort to figure out how I was going to do it. I had to source all this equipment, figure out how to actually get it all on screen at once and design demonstrations that would try and show how it would work when I don't have six other people to assist me. And I feel like I still missed the mark a little bit, but I just want to take a moment and thank all the people who made it possible at all, because this is my first video in my new studio. And this rig literally would not have fit in my old one, no which way or how. It was simply not possible. So if I tried to do this video back there, it would have been sorely disappointing for everyone, me in particular. For all the people supporting me, from those sending me a dollar a month to <laughs> ones sending more than I like to think about, I have no idea how to thank you effectively, but I will make you proud. To everyone else, thanks for watching.